Chad Dumas, welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. I'm really excited to be able to come back and reconnect. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you again. We last connected maybe six months or so ago um, and had a great conversation. Today, we're going to extend that and we're going to focus on leveraging the expertise of others within our organization. We all know that as leaders, um, we can't know everything, we can't control everything. And if we try to, it's going to really cause a lot of problems. Nobody likes to be yeah. um, and, and there's just going to be too many gaps, too many holes that we can't begin to, to fill, regardless of how smart or capable we might be. And so uh, the mark of a true leader, a good leader, and a successful leader is one that can attract and retain really great talent, uh, top-notch experts, and then leverage that expertise and empower them to, to really uh, fulfill their potential. Um, and so we're going to unpack that and talk about how we can go about doing that uh, on our team so that not only can we help our people be successful, our teams be successful, but, you know, of course, that then will extend to us and make us look good as leaders, too. So it's a win-win all the way around. Yeah. As we get started, Chad, I just wanted to share your bio with listeners. Uh, Chad Dumas is a Solution Tree Associate, an international educational consultant, presenter, and award-winning researcher whose primary focus is collaborating to develop capacity for continuous improvement. With over two decades of successful leadership experience, Chad has led significant improvements for both students and staff. He shares his research and knowledge in his new books, Let's Put the C in PLC, and an action guide to put the C in PLC and consulting that includes research stories, hands-on tools, and useful knowledge and practical skills. Uh, anything else, Chad, that you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Wow, man, as you were reading that, I was thinking, wow, that's, uh, I'd like to meet this guy. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, it's a great background, uh, great career, and you're doing important work. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, well, let's let's dive right on into the conversation. Um, and Tell, tell us a little bit about your experience when you're dealing with experts. Uh, now, yeah. within, within this kind of space that you navigate, uh, there's lots of people with lots of expertise. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that in a way that um, everyone feels like they can contribute, that they're empowered to, to and ha that they have the autonomy to, to, to leverage their expertise? Yeah, well, a number of different things come to my mind as uh, leaders who are, as you said, you know, if, if we don't leverage the expertise of others, then we're not going to be getting very far <laughs> uh, or very long, likely as well. You know, we'll be we'll be gone, kicked to the curb pretty quickly. And uh, whatever we try to accomplish will be uh, find itself in the dustbin of history, <laughs> if it even makes it that far, you know. Um, so uh, a number of things come to my mind. So the first thing that really comes to my mind uh, is kind of a foundational, like who we are as human beings is a belief in the capacity of others to rise to the challenges of the hour, whatever those challenges might be. Um, and I think that's like this foundational belief that we as leaders must have deeply embedded um, and manifest, you know, that then, then that belief, not just like a hidden thing, but then like it's acted upon with others. And uh, we can talk about some ways that we act on that here in a second. But I, I think that's just really critical. Uh, too many times um, people, um, maybe even leaders, um, don't necessarily assume that people have the capacity or can develop the capacity to rise to the challenges. And so that's like, that's like uh, the first thing. Uh, number one is we as leaders, in order to leverage the expertise of others, we have to believe that others' expertise can be leveraged. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a really good point. And it, it speaks to, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the humility that's needed among mm -hmm. leaders. And if, if you're an ego-driven leader, who always yeah. has to have all the answers, even if you don't truly believe you have all the answers, but you try to act like it, you have the false bravado, whatever. Uh, yeah. If that's the way you lead, uh, then of course you're never going to maximize the potential of your people. Um, right. And 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 you so you have to have this certain level of intellectual humility to recognize that you don't have yeah. all the answers that that you do yeah. need to leverage um, what other people have. And you know people 
move into leadership roles, usually because they're very capable and they're smart mm -hmm. and they have a lot mm -hmm. of experience. And so it can be very tempting to, to look at your own track record and say, you know what, I'm super successful. Everyone should do what I do uh, or do what I did and everyone should do what I say. And then that will lead to success. And man, that's, that's like a, a straight ticket uh, to failure if you do that consistently uh, because yeah. you're undermining your people. So again, starting with the humility, checking your yeah. ego at the door yeah. uh, and, and, and then that gives you at least the foundation to, to start to recognize the capacities of your people to then be able to leverage them. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you frame that with checking the ego at the door um, and starting with humility. It reminds me of uh, Jim Collins, great work around uh, from good to great and how he identified the two characteristics of the, I think called them level, level five leaders. And those two characteristics were an, uh, an intense professional drive and a strong personal humility. And those were the two unique characteristics that professional drive, strong professional drive and intense personal humility. And uh, those are the characteristics that uh, make, make leaders great or that he identified in his research of the greatest leaders uh, in business world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I cut you off. Um, that was yeah, the first yeah, no thing. Problem. Yes. So what comes so next? Then, yeah, so then then I think there's uh, a lot of things that come to my mind, but maybe we can just kind of like uh, play around with a few of these. So the very first thing that came to my mind in order to leverage the expertise of others is there has to be a level of trust in the organization between those who are in designated leadership positions and and others. And so, uh, and between, you know, between all. And so I've been uh, playing around with this idea of trust actually quite a bit le recently, thinking about the impact of trust. And, and um, there's some great resources on uh, a number of different places. Um, uh, Stephen Covey's work comes to mind, uh, uh, the son of, of the Stephen Covey of the Seven Habits. His son, Stephen Covey, has some things about um, leading, leading at the speed of trust, I think is what what he calls it, and then some other things. Um, and one of the things I've been, that really struck me recently is that um, trust is the intersection of being trusting and trustworthy. And I found that an interesting idea, like a Venn diagram, you know, where these two circles are overlapping and trust is the overlappingness between the extent to which we are trusting in others and trustworthy ourself. And when we can combine those two characteristics, the level of trust in the organization increases. I thought that was an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, and, and trust again is one of those foundational elements. You just have to have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we've all been in those environments where trust was lacking, regardless of whatever the best intentions were of the people yeah. in the organization. It's not really about intention. It's about the actual experience of the people. And if there's, yes. if the trust just isn't there, then yeah, you're, you're, you're not going to have people um, sticking their neck out their their neck out to, to try to, you know, leverage the expertise that they have, and especially yeah. in new creative and innovative ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, and connecting to leveraging the expertise of others, being trusting, I have to trust in others that they will rise to the occasion, that they will follow through on the things that they've been asked to do, right? So I'm, I'm trusting in them. And then I, on my side, need to be trustworthy. If somebody is asking for me to do something, I need to do it. If I am uh, being emailed and I'm not responding to email, gosh, that destroys trustworthiness really quickly and credibility and a whole heck of a lot of things, right? So so it, it comes back to, again, as a leader, in order to leverage the, the uh, expertise of others, I have to trust them. And then I have to be trustworthy in providing the resources, the time, the assistance, the support, whatever is necessary. And then between those two, then trust is developed. And I'll also just mention another thing that I, I, I ran across recently, which I found very interesting. Um, I think it was uh, some folks at Harvard um, talked about how um, trust in groups, specifically in groups, not necessarily in leveraging expertise, but in groups, in the group dynamic, you know, people will say, well, we don't have trust. And in order for people to be vulnerable, we need to develop trust. And what these 
researchers found is it's actually the other way around. That in order to develop trust, we have to be vulnerable with each other. And as we are vulnerable with each other, then the trust develops. And I thought, what, you know, what a great lesson to us as leaders. And it kind of goes back to checking the ego at the door. In order to be an effective leader, in order to build trust, I need to demonstrate vulnerability. I can't be this pompous, egotistical person thinking that I know everything and demonstrating that I know everything because that's not going to develop trust. But instead, being vulnerable and finding ways to say to folks, I don't know, or I don't have this answer, or I'm curious about, can you help me with um, ways to be vulnerable and therefore develop trust? Yeah, I really like that. That vulnerability, the vulnerability piece needs to be there if we if we have any hope of meaningful mutual accountability and trust within groups of people. Uh, and that, that's whether you're at home uh, with a partner and, and family, uh, with friends in the workplace, certainly that applies. Uh, and, and so we just need to, we, we need to create opportunities where we can have appropriate levels of vulnerability so we can yeah. develop yeah. the trust uh, and then maximize, uh, you know, leverage the trust uh, yeah. to do new yeah. and cool and creative things. And, and I love how you, you mentioned mutual accountability, because that's one of the next things that comes to my mind in order to leverage expertise is, is we need to have mutual accountability or shared accountability or reciprocal accountability. Like there's all these terms that float out there, but they're, you know, they're very similar. Uh, what it definitely is not <laughs> is top down hierarchical accountability. Um, so in order to leverage the expertise of each other, then we create systems of mutual accountability or reciprocal accountability where you know you're accountable to do x y and z and i am accountable to do a b and c and we hold each other mutually accountable and nobody's excluded from accountability um and one of the things i like to think about because sometimes the word accountability gets a, a negative rap is i like to think of accountability as responsibility and that i have a responsibility to you and you have a responsibility to me to to, to help each other. And so that's the kind of accountability we want. We don't want a punitive, top-down, negative, harsh accountability, but how do we hold each other accountable for doing the work that we say we're going to do so that we can leverage each other's expertise? Yeah. And the unfortunate truth in a lot of organizations is there's really only accountability one direction, right? Right. Um, so yeah. often you're only accountable up the line and, yeah. and there's really no mechanism or culture for leaders and executives to be held accountable. And so what you end up having a lot of times, and it's very, very frustrating to, to um, your people, is you have all these nice words come out of the mouths of leaders and executives, all these expectations are set, and then they do whatever they want. They, and there's like a different set of rules for leaders and for the kind of the, the average employee. And you know, there may even be some good reasons for some of that. The problem is, regardless of what the intention is, or whatever the, the, the good reason may or may not be, as soon as you do that, you're undermining trust, you're undermining yes. um, people's, uh, you know, the, their level of, of reliance on that you'll do what you say you're going to do. Um, and yeah. so you got to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And that definitely has to consistently be something that we're focusing on because it's just way too easy to fall into that trap, especially when you're in a position of, of authority over people where you have the yeah. power. Uh, if you're in a position with a title, it's super easy to fall back on, you know, you do what I say and then I do whatever I want to do because I'm in charge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> like you said, I mean, that creates a toxic culture um, <clears throat> and it, it won't leverage others expertise because you're, um, <clears throat> creating a, a dual dual hierarchy or dual system where it's good for thee, but not for me, uh, or it's good for the goose, but uh, not good for the gander, right? <laughs> so I mean, we've got like all these expressions in English to, to kind of express this uh, dislike of that type of uh, hierarchical, um, do what I say, not what I do type thing. Yeah, so th these are all great foundational pieces. Uh, what comes next for you in terms yeah. of being able to leverage expertise? Yeah, so 
so so these are like some foundational things but then uh the next thing that comes to my mind is <clears throat> excuse me in order to leverage <clears throat> excuse me let me take a drink of water here it's uh, stuck in my throat <clears throat> who knows if that'll help or not i don't know um so <clears throat> we as leaders we want to leverage the expertise of others in ways that are meaningful to the organization and to the person, both. So <clears throat> this raises two things in my mind. One is that we have to have um, strategic planning processes in place to help us know where we're going as an organization. Do we have our, our vision of where we're going, our mission of what we get up and do every day, our values and beliefs, our goals that are you know three to five year big hairy audacious goals with laid out specific objectives or outcomes um, and um, strategies and activities, right? So I'm just got like going through like the strategic planning process there that this sets the vision or the direction of the organization. And so with that direction, then that's the first thing. Then secondly, we have to know our people and so that we can help people find their places within that. And of course, as we're creating that strategic plan and that strategic direction, where folks are involved with that so they can see where they are in that process. So they have ownership in it. But as a leader, you have to do that, right? You have to help set that strategic direction. And then you have to know your people to be able to help them connect um, so that their skills and expertise are leveraged in the right direction um, to, to further the, the organization. <clears throat> yeah yeah knowing your people again it's one of those things that sounds so simple and i suppose it is it's not rocket science um, but it's hard to do because it just takes constant attention <laughs> yeah. um yeah. And, and you never arrive like you can't right. spend invest for a year on getting to know your people and then you're like i know my people <laughs> check and <laughs> like, <laughs> because people people change people have messy lives people you know circumstances change people's at aspirations change um right. you know th th there's just so many <clears throat> different things and so you just have to have regular cadence with your people and you have yep. to again yeah. back to that vulnerability there has to be enough vulnerability where they can truly be who they are so you can know who they are so you can know what is most salient to them, the motivators and the, the meaning and the purpose that matters to them the most. Um, there's yep. no way to get there unless you know your people. And there's no way to know yep. your people really, truly, uh, unless you develop the trust. Um, yep. And what what you don't want, I mean, so doing things like one-on-ones, great. If you, mm -hmm. if you can do yep. regular cadence, have one-on-ones, that's wonderful. But just the fact that you have those on the calendar and you do them doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get to know your people. Um, be, because unless that vulnerability is there, you, you just end up having people telling you what they think you want to hear <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because you're, yeah. you're the person that's in power. Um, and you, you're the person that's going to have influence over their, their bonuses and, or opportunities for promotion or whatever. And so you, you really do have to create that psychologically safe place where vulnerability is, is honored, uh, yeah. in order for people to feel willing to, to actually be their true authentic self. So you yeah. can know them. So you can do all these other things we're talking about. Yeah, I, I love how you framed that. And uh, you helped me get a clear understanding of something because I've, I've seen uh, some leaders who have one on ones that are completely ineffective. Um, and now, part of that is, sometimes they don't hold them, right? They schedule them, but then they cancel uh, or they cut them short or they arrive late or whatever, right? I mean, there's a variety of factors that go into that. But then I think you just uncovered something for me. And that is this idea of the leader being uh, vulnerable to develop that trust. And so to help make those one-on-ones effective to create that psychological safety. Um, and so our words and our deeds and how we say what we say um, having these meetings on the other person's turf, all these types of things really help to create that trust so that the one-on-ones can be effective, so that you can know your people, so that you can leverage their expertise for, for yeah, the good yeah. of the organization. Yeah. So then this all comes to empowerment. And, and so how, so we, we set the stage, we create the foundation now we recognize the expertise of our people. There's trust, there's accountability, 
vulnerability, everyone knows now that they can contribute in meaningful ways. Okay, now how do we unlock the empowerment so that they can take the lead uh, on you know their areas of expertise and not wait for us? That's one of the things I see all the time is you have you have e even a a pretty decent leader who's trying to create that environment, but they have people on their team who are tremendous experts in their niche, whatever it is, um, who, who just feel like they need to, like they, they can't run. They, so they're like, they're walking right. instead of running when they're able to run. Um, so how do you unlock that empowerment? <clears throat> yeah, well, I think you read my mind because that's where my mind went exactly next was, yeah, you've got these foundational pieces in place and then, and then it's a matter of empowering people. Um, for one of the things I found successful in my career has been the use of questions to empower others, uh, not to, because, um, you know, questions can be a double-edged sword, right? They can, they can empower, but they can also diminish. And the kinds of questions we ask and how we ask those questions really determine whether or not they're empowering, they're lifting people up and they're helping them along their way, or if they're diminishing and pulling, pulling somebody down. Um, and so questions that I like to ask are uh, around things like, well, what support do you need from me to be able to make X, Y, and Z happen? Uh, what would be an appropriate timeline for us to check back in and see how things are going on this particular project? Um, and now, when I asked these, these questions just now, I used what's known as a credible voice. My voice went down and they were not very open. Um, and so when I asked those questions, let me, let me rephrase, ask those questions now in an open, um, approachable type voice. And it might sound something like this. So <clears throat> now that we've identified these goals, A, B, and C, what support do you need from me to be able to be successful? I just use an approachable voice that has a lot more up and down modulation and ends with an up, as opposed to now that we've set these goals, what support do you need from me? It's very different and um, uninviting to the thinking, uninvited to the to the to empowering like the other. You're daring them to say something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's like yeah, as opposed to opening it up, and so you know, so thinking about the modulation of your voice. Anytime our voice modulates up and down, it's more approachable and people perceive us to be more approachable. Um, and so to help with that, um, if people are able to see the video, then my head is, is bobbing when I'm asking a question in an approachable voice. So when you're thinking about blah, 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 what are some things that you might help you with blah, blah, blah? My head is bobbing, which stretches the uh, vocal cords, which causes the pitch to go up and down and it creates an open and inviting uh, question. And so using questions to empower others can be really helpful if it's done with an approachable voice, if it's open-ended, and if it is, is uh, supportive of their work, right? So things like, what support do you need from me to be able to make this happen? When would be, a, instead of saying, let's touch base in two weeks, I'm saying, when would be an appropriate time for, for us to touch base again? And I'm putting it back in their lap and I'm using that approachable voice again, right? So um, these are some of the things that come to my mind um, and, then, and then doing it, you know, following through. Um, maybe, you know, periodically in between, if, if they say, you know what, I think give me six weeks, then maybe, you know, in three weeks, seeing in the hallway or whatever, uh, you know, I know you said six weeks. It's, I know it's not six weeks. Do you want to just you know, fill me in. What can I do to support you? Any challenges that you're having that I can help you with? Celebrations that you want to share? What, you know, how, how can I support you in this endeavor, right? So you're creating that atmosphere where they feel like they are in charge and they are in charge. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I love that. Um, Chad, it has just been a real pleasure. I note the time. I'm going to have to let you Whew. go here in a minute. It's flown by it so has, much fun. We'll have to do this again. Um, but before we close for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about your work and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so uh, my website is nextlearningsolutions.com. Um, probably the easiest way to track me down is on Twitter. Even if you don't have Twitter, you can find my hashtag and then that links to my website and everything else. And my Twitter handle is 
Very simple, at Chad Dumas, C-H-A-D-D-U-M-A-S. So there's two Ds in there, at Chad Dumas. And in terms of the final, final uh, thoughts on this topic is, um, if we ever thought that we could go it alone, um, COVID has taught us otherwise. And um, whether we're in schools or businesses or communities, we all need each other. And so the challenge of all of us, no matter what our role is, whether we're in nonprofits or churches or non-governmental organizations or businesses or schools or just in our own neighborhoods, we have to find ways to be able to access and leverage each other's expertise. And uh, I hope that these few ideas around believing in others, the importance of building trust, of setting up ways to hold each other mutually accountable, of ensuring that we've got plans that we're working toward and then empowering people towards those plans. I, I think these are uh, key ideas to help in accessing and leveraging each other's expertise. I love it. I love it. Chad, it has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Chad and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.